Another week brings another UND series win as the stakes continue to get higher. Welcome to this week's edition of North Dakota Hockey Central, your television home for all things UND hockey. I'm Alex Seinert. Coming up, we will hear from head coach Brad Barry on the state of his team as they enter the final month of the regular season. We will also look back at a memorable finish from four years ago in our latest walk down Ralph Engelstead Arena Memory Lane. First, though, we're going to bring you the latest installment of the always entertaining Through These Doors web series from Midco Sports and UND Hockey. Enjoy. From a young age, Brendan Booty knew his life would be different. However, he's never let his condition dampen his desire to make a difference. I was uh, eight years old when I got it. Um, didn't really know at the time, obviously, what it was. I remember I was just in uh, school and uh, my mom pulled me out and I uh, had to go spend, I think, seven days in the hospital and then another seven after that at uh, BC Children's Hospital, which they specialize in like diabetes and stuff like that. I can tell you when Colleen phoned me to say, you got to meet us at the hospital, Brendan has type one diabetes. Um, I was just floored, like I didn't know what to think, I was in shock. I think after spending that week at the Children's Hospital, they really educated us on the disease, how to manage it. I think like, you know, the first question for me was like, was I gonna like be able to play hockey? And you know, like they reassured me right away. They uh, brought in uh, a kid at the time, but he's older now. His name is Anthony Ast, and uh, well, he was playing uh, in the Western Hockey League for the Vancouver Giants. And uh, you know, he had type one diabetes, and he just like told me that he's playing and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I mean, that kind of you know showed me that like, I mean, obviously it's going to be a little harder, but uh, you know, that I could still do it if I wanted to. It's amazing how small moments in time can impact you for a lifetime, and and how it can change your outlook on things. Hockey was his life, I mean it still is, but he realized that he wasn't going to lose that and so it changed his attitude and I think it gave him a lot of hope after you know this boy came to visit, which was just an incredible gesture on their part. Just kind of growing up with it, I kind of learned how to manage it with hockey and stuff and uh, you know kind of every day is still like a new challenge. Um, you know when you're out there like Sometimes it may go low if you know you're like skating hard or like you know sometimes your blood sugar may be a little higher where you kind of you give yourself some incentive to bring it down so um, you know there's sometimes I'll have to take a shift off or take a little bit off to have a juice box or something like that. With Brendan you know there's a couple things going on first the physical side of it you know obviously being aware of his body and where it's at I think that's a continual thing that you always have to look at and then the other thing is the mental side of it too as far as making sure that uh, even though that you know he's dealing with something a lot of other players aren't that you have to be positive in, in the approach of uh, of your day and I think he does a good job on both. Calder finding Booty in front. Brendan Booty able to tap it home and North Dakota is on top. Well I can speak as a mom. I have Snapchat so I can see his face on a regular basis and he just knows. I need to see his face in the morning. Uh, that's mom checking in. But knowing that he's got really great roommates who definitely they know the signs of if he's low it's very reassuring. Being at home, being in his roommate, he's got um, insulin all over the place. We have to have some juice on hand, fruit snacks, sugar, just in case something happens. So I've learned a lot just from being his roommate, and uh, it's, it's pretty cool to see how he can juggle both being a diamondback and a D1 hockey player. Getting to live with him, it's definitely, um, you see how difficult it is, and um, I think it just says a lot about him, how, how mentally strong he is, and nobody really realizes how difficult it is, and, um, he does a really good job managing that for sure. He's just a very caring person in general. Um, he's always there for you if you need something. So yeah, it's been a treat to be his roommate and it's been really cool to see what he's been doing. He called us one night, this just before he wanted to make the post and he said that it's something that he'd been thinking about for a while and he wanted to give back. Yeah, it was something, you know, important to me. Um, kind of just donating my own money and like, kind of like raising a goal, I guess, you know. Um, my Instagram post is kind of like, you know, let everybody know. To be honest, I don't think any of us thought it would take off the way it took off. And, you know, it got a lot of traction, not only in Grand Forks and in the States and in the NCHC and stuff like that, even up here, because you get someone like Anthony reposting it. And then the Canadian Diabetes uh, Association reached out to Brendan and were having, you know, posting on their site and stuff like that. I mean, I kind of got into it with, uh, 
the American Diabetes Association too, for their giving hearts today. I helped them out with like a little video and stuff like that, and like had a lot of people reach out to me. And, you know, I've tried to uh, respond to a lot of people. Um, I guess the same thing is like trying to use my platform to, you know, like show people that I'm here, like, you know, playing hockey and going to school. And like, obviously I have type one diabetes, but uh, it, it didn't really like stop me. Yeah, no surprise there. Um, I think just seeing kind of what he does and whether it's uh, talking to younger kids or whatever and being an inspiration to those young guys and showing that he has those struggles and other kids do too, that you can still kind of compete at your highest level. And I think uh, he shows a great example of that. I know. He got a lot of interaction with his Instagram post and that's going to a great cause and I just think it's really cool how he's um, giving back and trying to raise awareness for what he goes through and I think it's honestly it's inspiring for the younger kids too that look up to him and the kids that are going through the same thing and they want to be hockey players too just to like let them know that it can be done and yeah, that's really cool. I think the focus is you know, there's other things out there. When when the lights aren't on, that's the time we focus on other things. And as true servant leaders, I think that's what you do is you don't focus on yourself, you focus on other people, on trying to help others. And it's nice to know that Brandon is carrying the torch. He struggled with injuries this year, and so we're even that much more proud of him, of him this year because it hasn't been an easy year on the ice, which that often happens in their hockey careers and we're proud of him that he has still been able to give back to others and still try to be an ambassador for something other than hockey as well. That shows a lot about Boots and, and his character, I think. Um, he's a very passionate guy and I think just kind of seeing stuff like that is, is a huge reason for kind of the person that he is and you look at what he's able to do on top of um, obviously dealing with, with the diabetes is pretty special. I think there's no doubt in Brennan, he realizes it. The UND platform is significant and so there's a lot of people that he can reach out to and, and try to make a difference and just show them that um, anything's possible, right? Like you, you can't let this disease control your life or define who you are as long as you respect it and manage it. The goal is like to make as far as I can in hockey and hopefully the NHL one day, but also like kind of carrying with me what I just started in December and you know, like along the way, just kind of using my hockey as a platform to like show people and like, you know, kind of try and be a role model, I guess, for younger kids like that. Good stuff from Marty Mueller, Jeremy Klein, and the rest of the Through These Doors crew. North Dakota Hockey Central continues on the other side of the break as Bradbury passes along the latest injury news to come out of UND's camp. That's next. back to North Dakota Hockey Central. Let's go now inside Ralph Engelstad Arena to catch up with UND head coach Brad Berry. Brad, thanks for the time. Yeah, absolutely, Alex. After earning five points against St. Cloud State the week prior, you picked up another home series win this past weekend against Omaha, starting with a 4-1 victory on Friday. What stood out to you about your Game 1 performance? Yeah, you know what, uh, we got the result that we wanted, but, you know, just going after the game in the locker room and just kind of, you know, watching how the, the first three periods unfolded there, uh, don't get me wrong, we'll take the win, but I, I didn't think we were as sharp as we should have been, and uh, and we ended up getting the result. Uh, kind of conversely, you know, Western Michigan a few weeks ago, I thought we played really well uh, to the point where we got a, we didn't get a, any points out of that series. So it's funny how hockey kind of works sometimes, but at the end of the day, I think you have to really concentrate on on the way you perform and you execute and you play. Yeah, that balance between performance and result. You did score three times in the second period on Friday to put the game out of reach, including two involving Mark Sendon directly after exiting the penalty box. What level of hockey IQ is required to make those goals happen? Well, you got to be ready to go. You know, we always talk about get ready for your next shift, you know, and, and whether that's five on five power play or penalty kill, when you're on the bench, you got to be ready. When you hop on the ice, you got to try to obviously add to the uh, to our group here and, and execute. And, and Mark Sendon, Coincidentally, twice on uh, Friday night he did, and they were big. There were huge goals for us coming out of the penalty box, and, and that's what an experienced guy does. You know, he, he's ready for each and every shift, and he, and he made the most of them on both plays. The last of your four goals Friday came from Ethan Frisch on the power play with under 10 seconds left in the second. Scoring late in periods has become a bit of a trademark of this year's team. What do you attribute that late period success to? Well, I think it's generally, you know, trying to, uh, you know, have focus and, and finish periods strong. We always talk about the first five minutes of a period have, have a push and the last five minutes of making sure that we have momentum going into that next period. And I think that was a huge goal for us. You know, uh, it was three to one at the time. 
And uh, by getting that late goal, it, it puts it a three goal lead going into the third period and it, it, it push, pushes momentum for that next period. So it was a key pivotal goal of the game. And, uh, and again, I'm glad we uh, executed on that play. Game two began much like game one with an early highlight reel goal from Reese Gaber. The sophomore would finish with five points on the weekend and is now ranked in the top five in the NCHC in scoring. How have you seen his game mature this year? Yeah, well, I think he's, uh, you know, that's part of him as not only as a player elevating his game, but the leadership side of, of him coming now. And, you know, that's what leaders do is they, they take it upon themselves to push the bar each and every day in practice and, and each and every day in, in the games they play in and, and try to be the best player on the ice. And, and he was very impactful both games this weekend. And, uh, and I can't just say enough about him, uh, you know, going into his second year here of just taking that leadership responsibility and elevating in that regard as well. Yeah, great player. You led 2-0 going into the third, but UNO would fight back to force overtime and eventually earn the extra point in three-on-three. Three. What did you see over the final 20 minutes that allowed them back into the contest? Well, you know what, just going back over the video and just the analytical side, you know, we only gave up, I believe, seven shots in the second period and six shots in the third. So we, we did a pretty good job of defending, but we, we gave up an untimely, uh, on, on our PK, on their power play, a goal that kind of gave them a little bit momentum. We had most of the kill. I think there was only like 12 seconds left in the power play, and they end up scoring on that, which gave momentum. And you could tell the next couple of shifts, they uh, they they had a little bit of a push there. The second goal that they scored was an unfortunate bounce. We boxed out in front, you know, had our man, but it went off a body and went straight up over top of uh, Zach Driscoll that had no chance on. So a couple of bounces that they got let him in the game. But for the most part, I thought we played the right way. And uh, probably on this night, on Saturday, played well enough to have a to win the game outright, to win the three points. But you know, a couple things that went into that game was you know midway through, or early in the second period, uh, a couple of our key players uh, weren't able to return to play, and we were down uh, a few numbers and bodies uh, trying to uh, play the rest of the game. Yeah, we'll get to those injuries in just a moment. Even in defeat, Brad, you were tight defensively for the sixth game in a row, allowing the Mavs just one goal in five on five all weekend, despite missing a couple of regulars on the blue line. What's been the biggest factor in your improvement on the defensive end of late? Just our commitment away from the puck. You know, obviously, you know, we, I think we were, we're trying to gain offense as far as, you know, doing different things to do that. But when we don't have the puck and having a mentality, not just with our, our defensemen on, on negating, you know, plays coming into our zone off the rush, but our forwards all, all tracking back and, and playing as a, as a five-man unit to, uh, to eliminate as many uh, offensive chances for the other team. So I think it's more of a mindset on how we're playing with a five-man unit on the ice. Well, as you mentioned, injuries are beginning to mount for your group with Mark Senton and Louis Jamernick, the latest to be added to that list. What can you tell us about their status as well as the availability of some of the others who have been sidelined lately from your group? Well, just kind of going early through the week, just trying to get an evaluation, you know, medically of, of where they're at. And then from there, just kind of doing uh, as much as we can do with them to try to get them back in our lineup here. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, both those guys are, are leaders. Uh, both those guys are play through a lot. And I, I'd fully expect them to, uh, you know, try to be available anytime that they're ready to go. But like I said, we're just going to make sure we, uh, we, we manage them the right way. You'll conclude a six-game homestand this coming weekend against the Colorado College team that you swept in Colorado Springs in mid-December. Still, it feels like the Tigers have taken steps forward in the last two months since you saw them. Yeah, for sure. You know, they're, they're a team that's growing uh, as the year went on. You know, they have a new coaching staff. You know, they have new players in their, in their group, and, you know, they're building and growing together. And you can tell, you know, uh, you know they've been playing games very tight, winning some games and, and losing games by a small margin. So... They're a team that's gotten better since the last time we played them in December, and, and we're going to have to make sure that we keep getting better as well. There is now just one month remaining in the regular season. What message do you have for your group as you hit this final stretch, Brad? Well, it's a sprint. You know, uh, like I said, we want to put our foot on the gas, and we want to make sure that we uh, play with a lot of energy, and managing our weeks in practice are going to be key. Guys that are uh, focusing on their bodies to make sure that they're, they're rejuvenated and re-energized and, and ready to go for the weekend is going to be key. And, and it's at, at the end of the day, there's a lot to fight for. We're fighting for the Penrose. We're fighting for you know, being in the national tournament. There's a lot of things that we're, that we're, we're uh, motivationally uh, moving forward uh, and looking forward to here. Still everything to play for for this team. As always, thanks for the time, Brad. Best of luck this weekend against the Tigers. Yeah, thanks, Alex. When North Dakota Hockey Central returns, we will flash back to a great moment in recent Ralph Engelstad Arena history starring Nick Jones. That's coming up next.
back. In honor of Ralph Engelstad Arena's 20th anniversary, we've been looking back all season long at some of the most memorable moments of the last two decades inside that building. One such game took place in March of 2018 when North Dakota defeated Omaha in the NCHC quarterfinals on a goal from Nick Jones that you don't see every day. Omaha came into our league a few years ago and uh, you know there's eight teams in our league and every team has a travel partner where you, uh, you either uh, play at your home rink or you play in their, their rink at the end of the year for the final two games and Omaha is our travel partners. I think it's a developing rivalry that has a lot of respect for each other. I didn't like them. Um, <laughs> I didn't like some of their centers. Nick Jones, you can kind of call him like a junkyard dog kind of a, a player. He was. He was a good 200-foot player. He was very good defensively and had very good offensive ability as well. He had a heart of a lion, and uh, you know, like he was a guy that competed each and every game, which pushed the bar of our team to a high level. We had a great team, great group of guys. Um, you know, that's a group of guys that I'm close with today. I would have done anything to play four years there. We won Friday night. I believe it was four nothing, and uh, you know, you got to win two games to, to move on to the Frozen Faceoff and. You know, when you win the first game, you always know the second game is going to be tough to win, and, and in this case, it was absolutely that. Definitely remember that game. I got I got that picture um, from the from the you know the net camera view of that goal, that tying goal in my in my house. We are going to overtime here in game number two in this NCHC quarterfinal series. You know, any overtime game I, that you play in. Um, you know, you you want to win. So I feel like every overtime game it has that pressure to it. And, um, you know, by the time we got to that point, we've played so many overtime games that, um, you know, we, we felt real comfortable in that position. I, I know that's kind of the stuff we were saying on the bench is, you know, how many times have we been here before? How many times have we won these games? Will there be a game three here at the Ralph? We will find out. Sudden death, five on five. There's usually not pretty goal scored in overtime. We got a puck to the net, missed the net, I believe. and. Went off the end boards. From my point of view, all I remember is the puck getting behind the net. And I tried, I've tried banking off the goalie, you know, probably 10 times in my life. I've never got it before. Um, and I just, you know, I, I kind of, out of the corner of my eye, I kind of saw he was getting back a little late. And I just thought, I'm just going to throw it, throw it, see if I can hit pad or see if I can hit something, get it, get it in the net there. As Kawaguchi puts one in. Sometimes when you get into a, an overtime game when, like I said, there's not a lot of time and space, you get kind of the, the, the greasy, not pretty goals that go in and, and uh, the typical goal is uh, Nick Jones that night. I don't, I'm not much of a celebration kind of guy. I mean, I'll get excited, but I, you know, there's, there's no planned celebrations with me. You know, I'm just happy to score. So um, for that one, it just kind of came me real quick. And uh, you know, next, Jordan's jumping on me and the rest of the guys are jumping on me. So it was a, that was an exciting goal. You know, it's one of those things where you had to do what you do to win a game in, in overtime, and it wasn't pretty, but got the job done. I scored a few over a few overtime goals in junior, four or five overtime goals in junior in the playoffs. Um, but you know, in, um, in that stage to be in the Ralph to do that, I think that um, that one would definitely take the cake. It's the most um, one I remember the most. You know, it was a special game, and that's definitely one I, I cherish. Nick only played two seasons at UND after transferring in from Ohio State, but he certainly made the most of his time in Kelly Green. As you could tell from the interview backdrop, Nick is currently starring for Manitoba in the American League, along with former UND teammates Austin Paganski and Hayden Shaw. We've got to step away for a moment, but when we come back here on North Dakota Hockey Central, we will preview the weekend ahead in the NCHC, highlighted by another crucial series in Grand Forks. Let's check in now on the latest around the world of college hockey, starting with this week's DCUUSCHO.com poll, where the top looks about the same as it has for the last three weeks. Minnesota State and Quinnipiac both earned sweeps to remain 1-2, while Denver moves ahead of an idle Michigan team after the Pio's winning streak extended to eight games following back-to-back -back wins over St. Cloud State. 
Those six points for the Pioneers combined with a four-point weekend for UND has stretched DU's lead in the Penrose Cup chase with four series remaining. Western Michigan also took maximum points from this past weekend, setting up a tight battle at the top with UMD, SCSU, and UNO all still in the hunt for home ice in the NCHC quarterfinals. All eight teams are in action again this Friday and Saturday with Minnesota Duluth heading to Denver and St. Cloud State hosting Western in a pair of top 10 battles. Miami will look to snap a nine game winless streak at home against Omaha, while North Dakota concludes a six game homestand against Colorado College. UND has won nine straight against the Tigers. Their last loss in the series came in March of 2019, but CC is not a team to be overlooked and North Dakota does not plan on doing so. Well, all the guys being out is, is kind of showing it. You know, everyone gets hurt, and um, there's, it's a long season, and lots of in injuries and adversity that you got to go through, and um, it's definitely showing it right now. Um, I think, you know, it's a lot of fun come, coming down to the end, um, a lot more competitive, and all the teams are, you know, dialed in and um, with structure and um, their systems and all that kind of stuff. So. Number 12, North Dakota versus Colorado College. UND's Penrose Cup defense hinges on a big weekend against the Tigers. And Midco Sports and NCHC.TV are your place to see it all starting at 7 p.m. on Friday and 6 p.m. on Saturday. It is the second to last home series of the regular season. So soak it in and then relive the action on our next edition of North Dakota Hockey Central one week from now. Until then, on behalf of our Midco Sports crew, I'm Alex Heinert. Thank you for watching. Enjoy the hockey this weekend.